And hi, everyone. Uh, and uh, as Finila already introduced, I'm Jaren Alton Tashvura. Uh, for those who don't know me yet, or for those who might have forgotten me during this time, uh, welcome to my docent lecture today. And welcome all those of you who are joining from Turkey today. I must admit that this has been a new learning process for me because this is the first online lecture that I have ever given. So um, in this online lecture today, during the next 30, 35 minutes, I will uh, try to present you my research on customer focused and sustainable logistics. But before, oh, let us, yeah, before going through my research journey, I will briefly introduce myself and uh, my personal journey that brought me here to Talmud today. And then I will shortly introduce the main concepts and actors that I zoom in and out uh, while conducting my studies. Uh, I will start uh, with my doctoral studies and then continue with the two main research tracks that I built, namely maritime transportation and logistics and sustainable logistics and supply chain management. And at the end, I will conclude with uh, some thoughts on logistics research and also my future research ideas. So, I come from Turkey, from Izmir, which is a city on the Aegean coast of Turkey. Here you can see it on the map and also on this picture. So it's a city which is 8,500 years old and uh, at the moment 4.4 million people are living in this city. And after spending all my childhood, my uh, school life and completing my bachelor's degree in this city, I moved to Istanbul, which you can see here again on the map, uh, where I started uh, my professional career. So having worked in marketing for a textile factory for a very short time, I stepped into the world of transportation, first in Istanbul and then continued in transportation back in Israel again. And here's a photo of me from my corporate life from 2005, actually. Uh, I worked for one of the world's carriers, five top carriers, Kapak Lloyd, for five years as a sales and marketing representative. And besides managing customer relationships and demand forecasting, I was selling these orange Kapak Lloyd containers uh, for the trade between Turkey and North and South America for five years. And after then, uh, I moved to the other side of the table and I uh, started to work as a customer of shipping line. Uh, as a marketing executive offering multiple logistic services and solutions at a Spanish uh, logistic service provider, which used to be called TransUnion back at then, but it was bought by a German logistic service provider afterwards, which is called Daxer. And while still working for Daxer, I decided to get a master's degree and uh, started with my master's studies uh, on total quality management at Dokuzeyli University, Izmir. So after six, six and a half years in transportation and logistics, lo logistics industry, I stepped into the academic world. And uh, while I was writing my master thesis, I was hired by Yashar University, Izmir, and actually their vocational high school. Uh, vocational high schools in Turkey are part of higher education institutes. Uh, which aim to provide a short cycle education to, in particular, to the selected industries. So that's why they are looking for people with long industrial experience. And that's why I was hired as a lecturer uh, to work at their logistics program. Then after a certain point of time, I founded the import and maritime management program at this vocational high school. And I uh, led that program for a few years at Yashar University. And meanwhile, in parallel, after completion of my master's degree, I started my PhD at Dokuzeyli University at business faculty. And I got my PhD at the end of 2013. And here's a photo of me with Okan uh, at the ceremony that day. Uh, I worked at both of these universities between these years. So I started teaching in 2009 and I have been teaching since then. And at both of these universities, I started working as a lecturer. And then after completion of my PhD, I worked as a tenured assistant professor. As I said, that this was my first online lecture, but actually it's not my uh, first docent lecture. 
So in uh, 2017, March, uh, right before applying to my postdoc in Sweden, uh, I was assessed and was granted the docent degree in Turkey, which is called very similar docent actually. And here is a photo after the oral examination that day. And meanwhile, I was in a search for international postdoc positions because I wanted to expand my international network and gain an international academic experience. Uh, in July uh, 2017, I started with my postdoc here at Chalmers and moved to Sweden with this little one here who was one and a half years old back at then. And uh, well, in parallel, my husband started to live up in the air and travel back and forth between the two countries. Uh, this has been a very big adventure for us, uh, but I think we learned many new things and adapted quite well. So since January 2020, I have been working as a senior lecturer here at Chalmers at the Department of Technology Management and Economics and Division of Service Management and Logistics. And I'm continuing to doing research and teaching in logistics and supply chain management. So this was my personal journey until now, and I will now continue with my research journey. So supply chain management is actually the scientific discipline that my work is related with. Uh, but I study the logistics system, which is a part of the supply chain. And the actors and flows that I concentrate on while doing my research are embedded in logistics system. So I adopt this unionist view to supply chain management. So I see supply chain management as an umbrella term and logistics management as a facilitator of flows between supply chain actors. And departing from there, I zoom in and out to different actors. So on the one side, there are sellers, shippers or suppliers, and on the other side, there are their customers, buyers or consignees. And in between them, there are these logistics service providers who might uh, own their own assets or don't. Uh, so they are buying services from some transport service operators or transport infrastructure operators. And in a general sense, I define myself as a transport and logistics researcher who acknowledges the role of these industries in the larger supply chains that they are uh, operating within. And uh, I adopt a customer-focused perspective to these industries. But then why do we need customer orientation? Well, uh, Gruen Rose once stated that a firm is always better off by designing and directing its activities to uh, the needs and wants of its selected target market. So here in this picture, you see a warehouse full of some boxes, which are either already sold or will be sold to some customers, and that these are produced by some suppliers. So this transaction that takes place at supply chain level uh, triggers the demand for logistic services. But then how do these supply chain actors want the boxes? How do they want to get them, receive them? In which quantity, at what speed, where, and in what shape? To be able to answer all these questions, we have to study customer requirements in a systematic way. Then, secondly, Samson uh, emphasizes that uh, services are always bidirectional. So a logistic service provider is always dependent on inputs from its customers to be able to provide the logistic service. They Either the uh, customer has to make the uh, products ready in a certain state, uh, or customer has to prepare required documentation or provide some timely or accurate information. So um, that's why to be able to provide logistic services, logistic service providers need inputs from their customers. And then thirdly, according to service dominant project, value can only be created by the beneficiary. So uh, we have to understand the use phase of logistic services in order to know what actually the customer values and to align the logistic service accordingly. So that was the part related with customer orientation. But then why do we need sustainability? I guess most of us are familiar with the triple bottom line concept and the people, planet and profit that we need all of them to have a balanced approach to growth and development. But I very much prefer this picture from Giddings et al that clearly shows the interdependence between these different pillars of triple bottom line. So if you, we want to continue living on this planet or if we want to survive and we want, if we want to continue making profits, 
we are clearly dependent on the environment that we are living in. But we know that uh, the environment is melting, actually. So we know that uh, the human-induced global warming is increasing. And according to latest research, we have to stabilize global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2030. And this requires cutting carbon emissions by 45 percent until 2030. And it is after just the next 10 years. Then how is this related with transportation and logistics? Well, uh, transportation accounts for a quarter of EU's uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and it is the second largest emitting sector after energy. And this has uh, very significant environmental and societal consequences. And that's why it is important to study logistics from a sustainability perspective. So keeping these two factors in mind, here in a very simple figure, I try to illustrate the different actors that I focus on while conducting my research in relation to each other. So on the very left hand side, we see the multiple tiers of suppliers who are working with some focal organizations or suppliers who buy logistics services from logistics service providers, which are using the services from some transport operators. And these transport operators are using services from uh, buying services from transport infrastructure operators such as ports, distribution centers, or logistics centers. And then on the right hand side, we see customers which are embedded in larger customer networks. And at the very end, we see consumers or end users, and the flows between them uh, are both ways. Uh, so starting with my doctoral studies, I departed from a practical problem there. Back at that time, there were many logistics center investments being undertaken in Turkey, and majority of them were initiated by local governments who wanted to boost uh, regional economic growth. But no one was going and asking to logistics service providers who were supposed to become the residents of these one-stop logistics shops if they want to become a resident or under which conditions would they want to become a resident of these centers but what is a logistics center in reality well here you see two photos one from verona italy and the other one from bremen germany uh, they're at the same time frequently called freight villages logistics centers so they are clearly demarcated areas where multiple activities uh, related with transportation, distribution, or logistics are uh, provided by various operators. And these areas are, must be preferably served by multiple transportation modes, such as road, rail, or inland waterways. And uh, these villages must have a single governor, and this governor can be a public institution, a private company, or public-private partnership, preferably that one. And these facilities are part of transportation infrastructure, but at the same time business generators for the regions that they are located at. Uh, based on that, I conducted a triangulated research study, both in terms of data sources, but also uh, data collection and analysis methods. Uh, and then at the end, I developed some customer criteria based on cluster theory to buy logistics services from these centers, and then developed a methodological base to prioritize that customer criteria uh, in relation to perceived importance for customers. And the main findings from my PhD studies show that there are various customers of logistics centers, and each of them have different expectations from these logistics clusters. So, for example, a rail operator is looking for economies of scale from these facilities. A warehouse operator is looking for a scope and outreach of the location. A port is looking for mostly dry port services and container-related services. And a shipper is looking for one-stop shop logistics mall services. And then when I zoomed into the logistics service providers themselves, I saw that they had many concerns uh, towards the different aspects of these facilities. The first one was related with governance issues. So logistics service providers didn't want the state to intervene. They didn't want public authorities to be there. Then the second issue was related with competition inside these villages. Uh, small logistics service providers had concerned 
uh, when compared with large logistic service providers. And they thought that they would have more advantages in these regions, in these facilities, if they once stepped into those uh, facilities. And then the third one was related with vulnerability of customer portfolios. So uh, logistic service providers thought that they would expose their customer portfolios because they were supposed to use the same infrastructure together within a clearly defined geographical area and that would cause them lose their market share. Well, at the end, by using a fuzzy quality function deployment methodology, uh, I uh, ended up with some prioritized service components, some of them tangible, some of them intangible. And among the highly prioritized tangible service components, there were basic infrastructure services, intermodal transportation services, and warehousing services. And intangible ones were the value-added services. Uh, and some examples are, for example, innovation support or marketing services for the companies there or conflict resolution services in these facilities. So after PhD, I started to build the two main research tracks that I mentioned in the beginning. The first one is maritime transportation and logistics. Uh, I still kept the customer focus in these studies, but I decided to focus on other actors, such as shipping lines, ports, freight forwarders, or shippers. Uh, among port-related studies, I focused on container ports and their market orientation activities. And in the study, the results showed us that Ports define their customers within a very limited scope. So they don't adopt a supply chain perspective while defining their customers. And that's why we recommended that they should resegment their markets if they want to uh, eliminate the barriers against market orientation in their organization. Then with another group of researchers, uh, this time we focused on the port industry revolution taking place at uh, value chains and how this affects seaports and their competitiveness, basically. And findings show that ports utilize some industry 4.0 technologies for achieving cost and differentiation advantages based on the different technologies. And in these two studies, our focus was mostly in business to business markets. So we were focusing on business customers. Uh, but then together with a master student of mine, this time we decided to focus on a transport infrastructure operator that is providing services to end users. So we uh, analyzed marinas and uh, their market segmentation approaches towards their customers, namely yachters. Uh, besides ports and marinas, I also conducted some studies where I focused on shipping lines. Uh, shipping is known as a conservative industry, actually, where a lot of inertia exists in the system. And there's a debate against it as well, but this is gener a generally used adjective for the industry. However, during the recent years, some large players decided to change their positions on value chains and uh, adopt a vertical integration strategy uh, to be able to provide some door-to-door -door logistic services to their customers. And this requires a high degree of customization and uh, customer orientedness. That's why I wanted to look into the service innovation at shipping lines and on what type of resources do they depend on while innovating their services. And the results of this study show that shipping lines are still depending on internal resources, intra-organization resources, rather than external resources such as uh, suppliers or customers for service innovation. And then in another study, this time we focused on the interaction uh, between the service, maritime service triad that is composed of uh, the shipping line, shipper, and freight forwarder. And we wanted to understand what type of operant resources do these different players bring into this maritime service triad to co-create value in this network. Having observed that power, trust, or information are very important operant resources, for value co-creation in this triad. At the moment, now we are doing uh, some additional research to observe uh, what happens when a new entrant enters into the service triad. What happens when a digital startup that provides services to all three players here in this triad, uh, and how does this digital startup change value co-creation patterns in this maritime logistics network? Then uh, this research also triggered some uh, other research ideas and together with a researcher in Italy, 
we are considering to extend this to a port-centric perspective. So we want to do a comparative uh, port study and uh, look into how ports, uh, when ports are introduced into this maritime logistics service trial, co-create value in this network. Uh, all these value co-creation studies have benefited a lot from this paper that I wrote uh, on the state of the art in service domain of logic and supply chain management in 2017. So I will continue extending this research avenue. Then the second research track that I developed is about sustainable logistics and supply chain management. Actually, there were two main studies that initiated this research track for me. The first one was a side project from my PhD thesis, where uh, we looked into um, environmental buying criteria from logistics centers while uh, business customers were buying from these facilities. And then, uh, together with another colleague of mine, this time we decided to change our focus towards to the customers of logistics services, namely supply chains. And first, we developed a research framework to study sustainable supply chain management activities of focal organizations. And we conducted a cross industry research, analyzed the Turkish listed companies and their sustainability reports by using this framework. And then, afterwards, we decided to focus on a problematic industry this time, namely fast fashion industry, to analyze what fast fashion companies were doing in, with respect to their sustainable supply chain management activities. Uh, this research attracted a lot of attention, actually, and is still among the most downloaded papers from this journal. Uh, the main findings from sustainable supply chain management studies are actually this framework that, uh, uh, together with my colleague, we developed. And this has been very helpful in teaching as well, because at the moment I'm using this framework in sustainable supply chains course, where students can use it to collect data on their case companies. Uh, to analyze their sustainable supply chain management activities. And uh, from the second study we did, here comes an example of how this framework can be used to map uh, certain industries or a certain companies' sustainable supply chain management activities. So this is the uh, evidence from fast fashion industry. Uh, then during my postdoc, I focused on logistic services and sustainability. And together with the research group here I work uh, with at Chalmers, uh, we first looked into logistic service providers and how do they transform into sustainable organizations. Uh, so in this first study, as a result of this first study, we developed a maturity model, uh, which helps to assess the gradual development of logistic service providers and the different stages that they pass through for becoming more sustainable. Then uh, for deeper analysis of logistic services, we decided to revisit existing service typologies, logistic service typologies, which are very much relationship or asset based. And uh, we used the service concept to uh, develop a new typology for logistic services. Um, afterwards, we moved into a different context, based logistics context, and we started to work with Gothenburg municipality in this context. Uh, first, well, this time we focused on the end user, uh, namely the household. And we looked into the new role of this uh, actor, how end users or consumers become the new suppliers when we look into waste logistics flows and uh, how sustainability of waste logistics can be influenced by services provided by these new suppliers. Uh, we continue to build up uh, our research in waste logistics context and borrow some concepts from marketing and operations management, such as service blueprinting and service modularity to analyze how sustainability can be improved in this context. And uh, we saw that there is great variety in structure in this context. And now at the moment, we are working on a project uh, where we uh, analyze if or how uh, service advancement can help to smooth this variety in structures and improve sustainability at the first mile. So these studies in waste logistics context were focusing on the first mile, but I also conducted some studies on the last mile. So together with a PhD student of mine, uh, in this study, we uh, analyzed a failed case, a failed sustainable urban logistics innovation. Actually, this was a collection and delivery point service from Istanbul. 
and we, by using multiple sources of data, uh, we explored the reasons behind this failure and saw that uh, both supply chain related contingencies, but also market related contingencies have affected this failure. Uh, in addition to those, I have been involved in other sustainable transport vision studies together with Chalmers Research. So in this study, uh, we looked into different digital tools and technologies and their ability to mitigate barriers in front of intermodal transportation. Uh, confirming previous research, we have seen that the biggest barrier is lack of willingness to share data between intermodal transportation actors. And then in another research, again, together with Chalmers researchers, we looked into uh, inland waterway transportation this time and uh, analyzed, benchmarked a successful case from the Netherlands to see uh, how this mode of transportation can be effectively utilized in uh, Sweden. So for the future, I, uh, I already mentioned some future research ideas, but I, what I'm seeing is that my two research tracks that I mentioned uh, are kind of converging to each other. So uh, I am doing both sustainability related but also maritime logistics related studies. But uh, doing a lot of research in waste logistics context actually provided uh, a lot of insights about circular economy for us. So I want to continue working in this context, but look into what type of new logistic services are needed to support a newly introduced circular business model. Then at the moment, I'm working on another project where we are looking into uh, how shipping lines are positioning their brands in relation to sustainability. And in this study, we are analyzing the tweets from shipping lines, the tweets that they are posting. So this is a social media analytics study and it's a new methodology for me. So it's a new learning opportunity. But then uh, the latest project that I'm working on and uh, will be working on for the next two years is this project, uh, which is funded by Chalmers Area of Advanced Transport. And as I mentioned, until now, I have always had a customer focus in my study. Uh, but my focus was on mostly on the homogeneous market segment. And this time in this project, uh, we decided to focus on the heterogeneous market segments, the OBS. And we decided not to improve the logistics system, but to question the logistics system. Because there are some cases where logistic services are creating some inequalities between different population segments. And in this project, we want to look into how logistic service innovation can solve these or eliminate these inequalities. And this research actually has gained even more importance now, uh, together with the current coronavirus crisis, because the pandemic created new population segments which uh, are lacking uh, access to certain goods and services. And that's why in the first study in this project, now we are looking into how urban logistics services are changing and what type of new actors are emerging to serve better to these new marginalized population segments. Uh, so in summary, I can say that in my research, I sometimes focused on transport and logistics actors in networks, and sometimes I focused on a single actor, such as a shipping line, or a port, or a logistics center in depth. And sometimes I shifted my focus to uh, supply chain actors, customers of logistics services, and their relation to logistics service networks. And I sometimes focused on the end user or consumer and their relation with logistics service. Uh, to conclude, there are three main points I would like to emphasize based on this, uh, uh, this part of my research journey, I can say. Uh, the first one is about sustainability transition. So uh, it is highly likely that we hear that every day a well-known brand, a large company saying that uh, as of next year, we are going 100% circular or we will become even more sustainable next year because we are raising the bar for compliance. But how is this possible without the supply network or service network following them? Or is it very easy for this service network to follow them immediately after these decisions? That's why I think uh, new actors, the changing role of existing actors, and new services required to facilitate these sustainability transitions in logistics and supply chain management, are important issues to study. 
And I don't think that discipline silos would help while doing that. And that's why I want to continue borrowing uh, concepts and tools from different domains or disciplines, such as service triads from service management or value co-creation from marketing to study logistics related phenomena. Then, uh, lastly, uh, everybody is very much keen on digital transformations and how these new technological innovations will solve logistics problems nowadays. But in reality, the pace of change is not that fast. And there is a lot of resistance in systems. And that's why I want to study, continue studying on the required resources, uh, the required capabilities or changes in these capabilities to enable digital transformations. And I think having a customer orientation as a starting point uh, would help understanding both perspectives towards this transformation in logistics. So thank you very much for listening to me, this first online lecture for me, and I would happily answer your questions if there are any.